All right, all right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It depends on where, wherever you are connecting from. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Adigbola, and I'm so excited to be on this show. This is our first show this year. I want to say on behalf of the host of uh, Kenai Show to say Happy New Year to you. Happy Earth, Happy Good Earth, and then make sure you do what you need to do to remain healthy also. So today we have come, you know, as usual, we're going to be discussing a very, very important uh, topic that I believe you all need to listen to. But before we get into that, I'm going to allow uh, our guest to introduce himself, my co-host to introduce himself, and of course the host to introduce the topic, and then we will dive in Big. So over to you, Dr. Obiora. Can you just introduce yourself to our audience? Uh, thank you very much for having me. My name is Dr. Obiora Odozo. Um, uh, I'm a kidney specialist, also critical care specialist here in Dallas, Texas, where I have my practice. And uh, I've been over 10 years in practice now. And it's mm -hmm. a pleasure to be on the show today. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And of course, I have a co-host right in the studio. Mr. Alex, go ahead and uh, say hello to our uh, Happy New Year, everybody. And uh, welcome to the program. My name is Alex Mairi. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And of course, uh, the conveyor of this program, the visionaire of this uh, program, of this show, are uh, the host herself will introduce the topic why she say hello and happy new year to you. Hello everyone and happy new year from our viewers from all over the world. Um, we are yet in another um, exciting year, 2023, um, where we will be bringing you um, important um, topics, um, health information, how you can keep yourself both body and mind together. Today, uh, we want to discuss a very um, small but critical organ in the body, the kidney. Um, that will be our focus today. Uh, we want to um, share critical information on why it is important for you to take good care of your mm -hmm. kidneys. You know, how can we do this successfully? And what price are we going to pay if we fail to take care of um, of this uh, critical organ, we need to make sure that um, you're taking care of it because so that it will last you longer, so that you can live longer, so that it can be healthy for you to live longer too. So that will be our focus today. And I'm so glad to have Dr. Obiara here with us. He's a kidney specialist, and um, please stay tuned and listen. And I will be sharing a whole lot more experience on this show today and why we chose this topic to be the first topic of the year. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So before we dive in, just in case you are watching this on YouTube, please uh, do us a favor, just like this video, subscribe to the YouTube channel if you have not and they share this video with someone. And if you are watching this and connected on Facebook, like this video, leave your comment. And remember, this is not a radio program. This is a social media program. And uh, we need to socialize. It needs to be a two-way communication. So if you have any question for our audience, our, our guy, mm -hmm. our, our panelists, make sure you drop your question. God bless you. And I hand over to Mr. Alex as a part of the kennel of today's show. Yeah, Dr. Biozo, you welcome once again. Happy New Year. It is always good for us to start and let, our, let the audience know what is kidney. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you for the question. It's actually Dr. Udozo, not Ubiozo. Udozo. I know it gets, it gets mixed up sometimes because of my first name and my last name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the kidneys. The kidneys are a bean... They are bean shaped organs we have in our lower abdomen, what we call our pelvis. And uh, it's, it has several functions. Uh, uh, one, it helps us regulate our 
water and salt balance. By salt, we mean sodium mainly, but also so many other salts like your calcium, your potassium, your phosphorus, helps regulate how much water we have in our body. It also helps to uh, excrete lots of organs, uh, 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 I mean, lots of toxic substances from our body also. It helps to regulate our acid-base balance. You know, um, there's so many functions the kidney is responsible for. It's even responsible for maintaining our hemoglobin level also too, and for maintaining our blood pressure. Um, so those are some of the functions of the kidney. Thank you for, for that, um, introducing what the kidneys are. Um, why do we have two kidneys? That's a good question. You know, uh, God made us in such a way that we have a right and a left side of the body. Some organs have been duplicated, uh, like, of course, the kidneys, uh, your eye, you have two eyes, you have two ears. Some organs are just one, like the liver and the spleen. God, and the heart. God also made us in such a way that we not do without some organs like we absolutely need a liver you absolutely need your heart okay but we also can do without a spleen also so why do we have two kidneys only god knows however <laughs> that's how he made it um, a lot of it has to do with uh, uh development during what we call embryology you know uh the kidneys come down we end up having two ovaries or two testicles, everything descends down. Even though in some patients, some people are born with just one kidney. That's a congenital problem. They're still able to do okay. The same way some people can donate a kidney and still be fine also. So yes, we have two kidneys, but people can survive with just one kidney. Okay. Uh, let us talk about how to care for this critical organ of the body. So what are the preliminary things you need to be doing to make sure that this kidney continues to be healthy? That's a good question. And it's all about being healthy. First of all, you, you have to ask yourself, uh, what are the major issues that damage our kidneys? And for us, Africans, our environment, we can't have this conversation without talking about uncontrolled hypertension and diabetes. So it's all about prevention. You have to know what your blood pressure is. You have to control your blood pressure. If you're diabetic, you have to have your sugar level under control. Also being overweight, uh, keeping your weight in check. And there are uh, so many other things that can cause damage to our kidneys that we can avoid, like harmful medications. And we can talk about all that later. Harmful medicines like um, pain medications, uh, what we call the NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, like um, uh, Toradol or, or, or... Tylenol. Well, Tylenol, not quite. Tylenol is a different, it's a different class. But all those medicines also, too, they can damage our kidneys. But to keep it simple, for us, blood pressure, diabetes, because those are the two main issues that damage kidneys in our, in our population. So keep blood pressure under control. If you're diabetic, keep that under control also, too. So if I may ask, so what are the red flags when i'm mean, talking about uh, kidney failures what are the red flags that we need to look out for okay that would depend on the type of kidney failure the patient is having uh, but by and large we have some broad symptoms some people might start seeing some blood in their urine uh, their urine some people also might start seeing foaming urine when they go clean the toilet it foams a lot. That means they are putting out a lot of protein in the urine. 
And protein in the urine is one of the early signs of kidney disease. Um, also, some people can start developing swelling in their legs. Their legs are getting swollen, and then it spreads to other parts of the body, up to their face. You see their eyes are swollen, what we call facial puffiness. And then when they check their blood pressure, for some people, their blood pressure goes very, very high. You know, and then these symptoms will progress. Uh, but what's scary is that people can have kidney failure and not even have any physical signs. And, uh, and they can have quite a severe decline in kidney function. So that's why it's important you have a primary care doctor and you go and check your kidneys often to see how they're doing. But these signs and symptoms I mentioned are usually the most common ones, leg swelling, some bloody urine, excessive uh, foaming of the urine that's suggestive of high, high protein content in the urine. And then for some people, their blood pressure also goes very, very high also. Very difficult to control blood pressure. So these are the simple signs some people have. Uh, yeah, I have a follow-up. Yes. You, you have raised a very, something that looks like a conflict of uh, um, logic. You initially said that high blood pressure can cause kidney failure. Now you are also saying that bad kidney will lead to high blood pressure. Can you reconcile the two? Oh yes. Um, when people have long-standing uncontrolled blood pressure, it slowly damages the kidneys because we have what we call the renal arteries, right? Okay. And and the pressure in those arteries are finely regulated. When it's very high it puts a lot of pressure on what we call uh the functional unit of the kidney that's the nephron okay and this pressure is eventually transmitted to even smaller cells in the kidneys what we call the glomerulus and when this when this pressure is sustained eventually it gets damaged now having said that some people that can develop kidney failure from whatever reason, they can develop hardening of the arteries that supply uh, blood to the kidneys. When these arteries get hardened, it can also cause high blood pressure too. And that's a problem. So that's how kidney failure can also cause difficult to control high blood pressure. Dr. Doz, I think he also wants to know the role of the kidney in um, controlling blood pressure okay now that's um it's a very it's a very complicated mechanism and it has to do with a whole lot of hormones okay um there's a hormone called renin <clears throat> excuse me called uh renin there's also a hormone called angiotensin now we have sensors at different, different arteries in our body, in our carotid artery, in our heart, and they sense when our blood pressure is high or when our blood pressure is low. And then, say for example, it senses that our blood pressure is low. It causes production of some of these hormones, okay? And there's what we call a cascade from renin, angiotensin one, angiotensin two. Eventually it causes production of a hormone called aldosterone. Okay, and aldosterone is produced from a tiny bunch of cells that sit on top of the kidney call, uh, called the adrenals. And then um, uh, aldosterone is responsible for reabsorption of sodium. Sodium is salt. Sodium causes our blood pressure to be high. So that's why when people have high blood pressure, they tell them to restrict the salt intake. And so... Uh, this hormone causes reabsorption of uh, sodium and water. I'm sorry, I had a call come through. Am I still on? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, in, the, in the same way also too, if our blood pressure is high, if our blood pressure is high, the, the these cells sense 
the high blood pressure also too. And then they reduce production of these hormones. As a result, you have lower aldosterone and then we have less reabsorption of sodium and water. So that's how the kidneys help to regulate blood pressure. All right. So talking about uh, kidney failure, uh, so what are the stages of kidney failures that we, that we can discuss right on this show? Okay. Stages of kidney failure, they are, they are graded from, uh, from 1 to 5, stage 1 to 5, depending on the degree. We have something called the GFR. That's called the glomerular filtration rate. The glomerulus is a function of one of the functional units of the kidney. And it has a blood vessel, uh, a blood vessel that goes in and one that goes out. And uh, that's where fluid, protein, all kinds of things are reabsorbed. Um, and when it gets, and we measure how much water it filters, it eventually filters the urine. So blood goes through it and then it filters out all the stuff that's going to be excreted, holds on to water and some proteins, and then urine now goes out through the ureters. And when we measure the rate at which fluid goes through, that's called the glomerular filtration rate. And so many things can affect it. When it starts reducing from whatever reason, either continuous damage from diabetes or high blood pressure, or harmful medications, it begins to decline. And normal is about 100. It's measured in millimeters per minute. Normal is about 100 and above or 90 and above. And so it's measured um, less than 50 mils per minute is stage five. So kidney failure stages now is measured from stage one to stage five with less than 50 mils per minute being uh, stage five. And stage, stage one is about, uh, stage one is greater than 90. Maybe they have high blood pressure. Um, uh, stage three is divided into 3A and 3B. Stage 3A can be like from 45 to 59, 3B 30 to 44 mils per minute. And then stage four, 15 to 29, yes. However, we have to be careful with the measurement of the GFR because so many things come into play. And we have several different formulas for measuring the GFR because of the difficulty in, in getting accurate measurement. Uh, now we use age, race, sex, uh, weight also. And that's why... Uh, different formulas have been used to try and get the accurate GFR for each patient. And so many things can affect a single value also. If, if a patient is dehydrated or they have excessive muscle mass, like in weightlifters, if they're severely malnourished, all these things can affect the GFR. That's why to be very accurate and get the most accurate stage of kidney failure is best to do what they call a 24-hour urine collection. Okay, but that's cumbersome. That's why it's not done as often, but is uh, the best way to go, do a 24-hour urine collection and then calculate the GFR based on measurements from that urine. That will help put the patient in the correct stage of kidney failure. But we do not start talking about dialysis until patients get to stage five. When they get to stage five, that's when we start talking about dialysis or kidney transplant, as the case may be. So before, um, sorry, um, 
I know they always encourage us to drink uh, more fluid. And when they say fluid, not beer now, but not alcohol, but talking about water, right? Yes. So what role does that actually play? Because, I mean, most people watching us right now, they are just a layman like me, try to understand this whole concept. Because the GFR, as you are mentioning GFR now, my mind is just going to a tie to that federal government of Nigeria normally gives to <laughs> So, but now to a layman watching us, what are the, I know maybe I'm fast forwarding the questions, but what are the basic things that we can do to guide our kidney to, and of course I talk about water. So like how many fluid do we need to drink a day and so on and so forth like that? Okay. Uh, there's no need to force yourself to drink more water than you need. Only if you have a certain medical condition that have been told to drink in more than you need. So people should drink only when they are thirsty. When you're thirsty, drink water. That's the answer to that. Before there was a study that people need eight glasses of water a day. Right. Not true. Just drink when you're thirsty. So if I'm not thirsty throughout the day... No, you. if you're not thirsty throughout the day, then you have a medical problem. <laughs> and if I'm thirsty just one or two times? It's a... Drink when you're thirsty. Uh, uh, the kidneys also help to regulate that through another mechanism also, too. So that's why... And... Um, um, and, and when we are thirsty, what happens is that the water in our body drops, our sodium level rises, our brain detects it, a part of our brain called the hypothalamus will detect it, and will now cause us to be thirsty. Now, if for any reason you're not thirsty, that's a medical problem. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, but people should not feel like they have to force themselves to keep drinking water. That in of itself can cause problems. So that's why we recommend people drink when you're thirsty, try and stay hydrated. Okay, doctor, I'm going I'm to rewind us a little bit. Okay? <laughs> I asked this question, so I have the microphone. Uh, because my doctor, you, I mean, once told me to always make sure I drink eight bottles of water. Eight. And sometimes I don't drink more than two. In fact, my doctor gave me a container that I'm supposed to be drinking from, <laughs> okay, throughout the day. And I discovered that if I fill up that uh, jug or that container, it might stay a whole week and I'm supposed to consume it in a day. So does that mean that I'm sick? Or this bottle of water, like how many of it are supposed, uh, am I supposed to drink in a day? Okay. Now, there are some patients who recommend they drink more than normal. And these are patients that have kidney stones. And that's a different patient population. That's a medical condition. And we're asking them to drink a lot of water because we want to keep the urine flowing because that reduces stone formation, okay? And helps them keep passing the stones. Now, if you're not forming kidney stones, if you're otherwise healthy, what we we'll recommend is just stay hydrated, just drink as much water as your body will tell you when you need water. When you're thirsty, go and drink water. Don't uh, hold the thirst back. And you're drinking excess water when you're not thirsty won't really help you. All you're going to do, your kidneys will just pee it out. Assuming your kidneys are working well, your kidneys will pee it out. Hmm. But there are some people who, who have a condition where they drink a lot of water or, or what has happened here, they have one of these challenges that they have that goes around on TikTok <laughs> where they, are a, they challenge each other to drink a certain amount of water. Now, when people drink more water than their kidneys are able to excrete, it dilutes the sodium 
So your sodium is low. It can make the brain cells swell. People can have seizures and that. But that's the extreme. But it has happened. Wow. Yes. So that's, and there's a psychiatric condition called psychogenic polydipsia. Some mm. people just feel the need to keep drinking water. They keep drinking water, drinking water. You check them, their sodium is very low. The only way, and the only way to treat that sometimes is to put them in a place where they don't have access to <laughs> water. <laughs> yeah, to free water. So in answer to the question again, you don't have to drink 10 gallons of water a day. Drink when you're thirsty. Drink. But Dr. Odozo, I have seen um, several patients that have, um, you know, high creatinine or low EGFR. When they increase their fluid intake, the EGFR and the creatinine improves. How yes. would you explain that? Yes, that's because they've dilute, they have diluted their creatinine. They've just diluted the numbers. Hmm. So if the baseline creatinine is 1.4, 1.5, and then they go and overhydrate, and you measure the creatinine, it's going to be 1.1 or 1.2. Likewise, the BUN also too. But that is an overhydrated state. Can they remain like that constantly? No. It's just, they're just, it's, it's, uh, it's artificial. So, so you're that's saying not, that's not their true GFR. So, so you're saying the kidney is not filtering that well? That it is artificial? No, it's it's filtering, but um, uh, it's not immediately they drink the water, they pee right away. It goes through a process. Okay, so that's why some people can be volume overloaded. So, if they drink a lot of water right now, and they are overhydrated. And then they go and do all those measurements when they are overhydrated. <clears throat> those measurements will be artificially lower. Mm. Or if they wait and they now pee out all the water and, and they are at a normal volume status, meaning they are not volume overloaded and they are not dehydrated, they are normal, what we call EU euvolemia that will give a true picture of what their GFR is. And that's when they should go and get it measured. Okay, okay. can I uh, ask a question? Um, I believe uh, with your name, I believe you are not a Muslim, you are a Christian, right? Yes. Okay, so I want to divert a little bit. I know mm -hmm. like this is January now, so many churches are fasting, yes. especially Nigerian community churches. Some 100 days, some 50 days, some 40 days, some seven days, and some with them back on what is called dry fasting. So, why some people are fasting, they don't drink water. Some, when they are fasting, they are encouraged to drink water, like what we are discussing, to help to promote your living. Why, before, if you are fasting, they believe that okay, if you drink water, you have broken your fasting. So what do you have to say with respect to that? Like, I'm not talking about being religious now, but I'm talking about the, it's like still going back to the same question I asked because we've had circumstances or, uh, I mean, stories of people who are backing on fasting and before you know it, they slump and die while they are fasting and praying because <laughs> you can, I mean, the Bible talks about the 10 virgin, right? The Bible talks about the 10 virgin, five the Bible call it five wise one and five foolish one. The reason why they are foolish is because they didn't do what they're supposed to do. You can be a Christian and you are still foolish, you are still stupid. So you can be fasting and you die where you are praying, where you are still fasting. So what can you or what can you say about this? How do you address this? Okay. First of all, people should only fast uh, uh, if they are healthy and based on the guidance of their physician, the primary doctor, the family doctor. Now, what happens when we're fasting with regards water, okay? Because what happens with food and glucose is a whole another conversation. Our insulin levels will drop, you know, and then uh, the stress hormones will reduce also 
and that's different. Now let's talk about water balance. When our body senses decreased water, or we're not taking in enough water, we now produce a certain hormone called vasopressin, or it's also called ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Now, diuretic means letting go of water, okay? So bottom line, what this hormone does, its job is to hold on to water in the body, okay? So it's produced in one of the cells in our brain, and it goes down and tells the kidney that, listen, this person is dehydrated. This person is not drinking in enough water. Kidney, stop letting water go. And it closes some channels in the kidney, and then it holds on to water. That is what happens in the fasting state. But you need to have functioning kidneys for this to happen. And that's why people are able to go through several hours without drinking water while they are fasting, if they are healthy. And that's why fasting should only be done with the guidance of their primary care physician. Not their pastor. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to get me into that. Are you shifting the, are you shifting the authority? <laughs> You're not going to get me into that one. Oh. Dr. Let Dr. Me, let me let me ask you. Um, we were talking about EGFR a minute ago and the stages of um, chronic kidney disease. Yes. So um, I found out that most of the time, um, unless that the EGFR, um, which you have explained several ways that is calculated and may not be, you know, true figure sometimes whenever is is only when it's less than 60 that's when the doctors tend to panic you know are there other there are other stages where maybe things can be remedied you know to prevent it from going lower than 60 because you know when you do the labs if it's 60 and above you know then they're fine but unless they're less than 60 then they will not discuss it with the patient. Isn't there a stage where some of these conversations needs to start so that the kidneys can be preserved? Yes, yes, yes. Um, maybe, maybe the physicians are not having conversations with the patient when it's 60, 70. Maybe they've looked at other criteria and they know that GFR is not accurate, okay? okay? Maybe that's why they're not having that conversation. Now, if it's really ascertained that a patient has a low GFR, maybe early chronic kidney disease, stage one or two, yes, there are things that can be done to uh, prevent further decline. And uh, it all depends on what's causing the kidney failure. So for example, it's diabetes. Long-standing uncontrolled diabetes damages the kidneys and starts causing the kidney to put out protein in the urine. And the more protein that's put out by the kidneys, the worse damage to the kidneys. So what the kidney doctor does is put the patient on the medicine to reduce uh, protein in the urine, okay? And this medicine, they're called uh, ACE inhibitors like lisinopril or some other medicines like that. So they reduce uh, the process by which the kidney loses protein. We call that just renal protein excretion. By reducing it, it stops further decline of the kidneys. And if it's still very early, there might actually be some improvement in kidney function. That's why it's all about catching things early. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I, I do have a follow-up question. Okay. Some of um, you mentioned is is medications. Yes. Sometimes, sometimes when you have kidney failure, also 
So they protect the kidney, but on the other hand, it can be harmful to the kidney as well. Correct? Yes. Yes. This ACE inhibitor, ACE inhibitor, or what we also call angiotensin receptor blockers, they are cousins. Sometimes it can come with a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Uh, overall, it is very protective of the kidneys. And what some studies have shown us now, because what happens is that when we start patients on these medicines, it can cause some what we call some constriction in some arteries, and some of the kidney numbers will go up, which is going up the wrong way. Now, these medicines are still so good for kidney function that what we watch now is how, how, um, how do I put it now? Okay. What we're watching is the creatinine, if the creatinine goes up. We watch for how high the creatinine goes. If it doesn't go up too high, we continue the medicine because we know eventually it will start to come down. Okay. Okay. And again, what we have found is that some patients who will actually benefit from this medicine are the ones whose creatinine will go up initially. So creatinine going up initially is not necessarily a bad thing. Okay. They might, they will, uh, uh, they will continue the lysinopril or they might reduce the dose while keeping an eye on the kidney numbers. Because the goal is to reduce the amount of protein that the kidneys are putting out. Yeah, Mr. Alex. That, that, uh, let us go back to something the layman may be, may be listening to here. And that is what type of local food can you eat to promote the kidney? And what type of food should you just get out from? You know, no. Okay, let's talk about uh, let's talk about foods to avoid. Avoid whatever will raise blood pressure or will make blood pressure difficult to control. So high salt diets, processed food, you know, um, uh, sausages and excessive added salt in food and things like that. Avoid that. Uh, avoid high cholesterol food, like animal fat, things like that also. Um, then things that will promote kidney health are basically things that will promote good health in general. Vegetables, uh, fruits, and things like that, exercising, things like that. So uh, let me, uh, like, I mean, the one little bit, um, thank you, by the way, for sharing all of this. I'm really learning myself. Well, I was watching a movie one day, and uh, this guy went to his uh, uncle ask, uh, begging for money. And, of course, the uncle told him that, uh, well, I don't have money. And the guy was saying that, okay, so what do you want me to do? Then the uncle told him that, well, you have two kidneys. You only need one to survive. So you know what to do. So the apparent of that is that some people now sell their kidney, you know, intentionally for money. Some actually donate it. Maybe uh, there's a testimony of a guy that just, you know, met someone on uh, Facebook. And of course, he, he just went to donate his kidney. So what is danger in doing that? Okay, leave it. Okay, you have two originally because God knows that you need the two. That's why he gave you two, even though we need one to survive. But either voluntarily or involuntarily now, you decide to sell one or donate one. So what is the danger? What is the risk in that, having just one remain? Well, well, um, like you said, we can do very well with one kidney, live a normal life with just one kidney. And that's why we, we always encourage uh, donation of kidneys to those that need it. Nobody should be coerced, you know, to donate a kidney, either for financial or any other gain. It should be something that's voluntary, either you're doing for a family member or for just anybody that needs a kidney if you're a match. 
you know. And uh, yes, we can do well with just one kidney. Are there risks of living with one kidney? I would say it would be kind of the same as living with two kidneys, just that now you only have one kidney left now. And so uh, if, if there's damage to that one kidney, you, uh, the patient ends up on dialysis uh, and damage for whatever reason from uh, medications, just all the damages that can damage both kidneys. But they are now at higher risk now uh, since they only have one kidney. But if they live a healthy lifestyle, do all that they are supposed to do, they will live just well with one kidney. The kidney um, uh, has a way, it starts, once the body senses that we have just one kidney, it begins to work harder. And more what we call nephrons. They get larger and, and, and yes, it can do the work of two kidneys. Just mm -hmm. fine. Oh, thank you. We have a question from a viewer, uh, Regina Ugochuku. So the question is, uh, is alcohol bad for kidneys, doctor? I guess this person knows the answer to the question. Actually. Exactly. So, <laughs> I, I, and I think the question should have been that why is alcohol bad for kidneys? That's how, we, how I will put it. So go ahead okay. and answer the question. Okay. Um, everything in moderation. Um, everything in moderation. Uh, so, uh, too much of alcohol damages so many other organs that can eventually damage the kidney. Sometimes we call the kidney the innocent bystander in the body because the kidney is a very resilient organ. But when things start going bad in other organs, the heart, the liver, elsewhere, it affects the kidneys. So alcohol damages the liver and that can damage the kidney. That's, it's a condition we call hepatorenal syndrome. You know, alcohol can also damage the, uh, the heart too. And then you have a condition called cardiorenal syndrome. Now, it depends on the kind of alcohol and the quantity you start drinking you know, before you start talking about it now, damaging the tubules and, I mean, causing direct damage to the kidneys. It has to be really excessive and has to be the, to uh, the toxic form of alcohol. Because what we've noticed some people, some of our people do, they go brew this Kai Kai or Gogoro, you know, the illicit, alcohol in their backyard and it ends up having lots of toxic chemicals it's not supposed to have and these ones directly damage the kidneys and it can cause immediate death especially if if you don't have the type of facilities you need immediately because there are some medicines you have to give them emergently you have to start dialyzing them immediately and for many places, none of that is available. So this is how alcohol in of itself can directly damage the kidneys, okay? And then indirectly also by damaging some other organs too. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing. And I hope uh, Gochuku has uh, gotten <laughs> answer to that. And I have a, I have a confession to make. Uh, when we started this show today, it started boring for me, okay? And I was looking at, okay, so we're talking about kidney, kidney. So for the first five minutes, I was I was really struggling with this show. But then as we started, uh, you began to give value. And I think uh, you've really, really done justice to this, even though we still have a lot a lot of questions to, to take care of. So thank you so much for, for sharing that, for You're teaching welcome. for teaching us. So uh, I have a question here that says, okay, so why is a damaged, I know we've talked about kidney failure, we've talked about, so why is a damaged kidney not removed from the body? That is one of the questions that we have now. Now, sometimes damaged kidney is removed. It depends on what's causing damage to the kidney. Now, um, 
some patients have horrible infections of the kidney where the kidney might even form like abscesses and is really bad. That kidney has to be removed. Okay. Then some patients also have a different type of problem where they form what we call cysts. Cysts are like large balloons in the kidney. Okay. Then the kidneys become very, very big. And once in a while, one of the balloons can pop. They have blood in the urine. It causes pain. Those kidneys eventually have to be removed. But if people have chronic kidney disease from maybe long-standing high blood pressure or diabetes, with time, so on these kidneys, they actually shrink in size. Okay? And it's not causing problems. Going to remove it now, you have to start removing the blood supply and all that. Patients can bleed. And it also depends on the degree of damage. It might, they might have chronic kidney disease, but not end stage. And the kidneys are still responsible for producing some hormones. So they might still, be, still have other functions they are doing in the body and still be useful. So that's some of the reasons why it's not... It's not taken out. Dr. Dozor, um, in the past, um, kidney has been uh, one of those organs that people thought that the cells do not regenerate, like the liver. Is, is it true that the kidney, the kidney cells do regenerate and can improve? Well, I won't say regenerate, because regeneration means it's growing new cells and, it's get, you know... Uh, not not quite however uh damaged kidneys can improve say for example there's a type of kidney damage we call um atm now there's a part of the kidney. do you say atm do you say atm no <laughs> atm not a atm okay. atm okay Okay, it's a long word, stands for acute tubular necrosis. Right. Now, there's a part of the kidney called the tubules. Now, the tubule is that part of the kidney where water, salt, so many things go back and forth across, okay? And it's lined by certain cells. So necrosis means to die. So when patients have acute tubular necrosis, it means the cells die. And there are many things that can cause the cells to die, infection, low blood pressure, bad drugs. Now they die and patients go into kidney failure. In fact, they can even go into kidney failure to the extent of needing hemodialysis, okay? But these cells, they can repair and come back on their own. And patients can come off dialysis. But it's only in this type of kidney failure where you can say cells are coming back. Okay. Yeah. Now in, in, in some other forms of chronic kidney disease, maybe from uh, the one caused by diabetes, kidneys are putting out protein, they get some damage, still just early damage. And then you put them on some lysinopril, the kidneys can improve. But once it gets really, really advanced, it's done. Mm. Yeah, yeah, look, yeah, let me ask, uh, has age anything to do with the efficiency of the kidney? Yes, yes. As we get older, we lose, we slowly lose kidney function. That's because we're losing, um, uh, a kidney has functional cells or functional units. Each kidney has several millions each. As we get older, they slowly die. So our, remember what I mentioned earlier called the GFR, used to use as a guide to measure kidney function. As we get older, we slowly lose GFR. Above a certain age, I think it's about a, a mil per minute per year, something like that. I'll, I'll have to double check. But the answer to your question is yes. As we get older, we slowly lose 
kidney function, GFR. Oh, so but I can, I can not, be taken as not, Yes, but it's not severe enough that we have to do anything about it. That's just the way God made us. So as you get older, you begin to lose some cells. So what if you are now taking some anti-aging supplement? So to refuse to... <laughs> <laughs> Would that if help? You know where, please, if you know why they are selling that anti-aging, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go and buy <laughs> So let me ask this question about uh, a, a lady or a woman with one kidney. So can a woman with a single kidney become pregnant without endangering her life? Is there any risk with that? Yes, she can get pregnant and have a normal pregnancy. She just has to uh, have that pregnancy working closely with her kidney specialist and her gynecologist. Why? Because there are a whole lot of uh, physiologic changes that take place during pregnancy. You know, even the GFR goes up because our blood, our blood volume increases. You know, they, they retain water. Um, uh, for some women, blood pressure goes up also. Um, and so she would just need to be followed closely by her kidney doctor and her gynecologist. But the answer is yes. She can have a very safe, healthy pregnancy. All right. Before I hand over to Mr. Alex, just in case you are watching this once again, um, Facebook, Please don't forget to like this video, leave your comment, and uh, most importantly, share this with your network. Share this with your friend. You don't know who you might be helping or saving. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can just copy the link, share it on your WhatsApp. You know, this is a free program. Nobody is paying anybody, and nobody is paying even our panelists that is giving us uh, his time, okay? at his own free will. So please do us that favor and God bless you as you do that. Over to you, Mr. Alex. Yeah, um, you have said initially there are certain, certain form of medication that can cause kidney problems for people. But I want to ask, if uh, can abortion affect the kidney in any way? Um, only if it gets complicated and then they develop an infection, for example, they have what we call retained products of conception, and that causes a, a, a horrible infection that spreads throughout the body, otherwise known as sepsis, and then they go into shock, and shock is just where the blood pressure is now very, very low, then it can damage the kidneys. And there also, there are some other harmful substances that are produce when people have sepsis. This can also damage the kidneys. Dr. Dozor, um, I know we are winding down here. Um, I felt that it's important also to let our viewers um, know about supplements and teas. A lot of people drink a lot of tea and take a lot of supplements. Um, are there certain ones that can cause kidney damage? You know, um, there are so many herbal things uh, that can cause kidney damage. The issue with those things are that a lot of them are not vetted. And when people take these things, we don't even know what they are even taking. So that's why I can't start giving names. And that, so that's why we just tell people, be very, very careful what you put into your body. Look at labels. If there are things you cannot recognize, long names, long chemical names, just avoid them. Are there supplements that can help improve kidney function? Um, supplements, off the top of my head, no. Just stay healthy. If you eat a balanced, as a rule, if you eat a balanced nutritional diet, you don't even need to take supplements in the first place. So eat a balance, uh, a diet that's well balanced with vegetables and fruits. You don't need supplements. Is there any kind of, you have already said, uh, apart from the spread effect of 
kidney problems, kidney infection. Is there any type of kidney infection that can be contagious? Um, kidney infection that is contagious. Yeah. <laughs> is there any type? Um, no, no, no. Because most infections that cause kidney problems are like your regular infections. It could be bacterial, E. coli, and the rest of them. It could be a fungus. It could be staph. Now, only if you're talking about sexually transmitted diseases. Now, that's different. Sexually transmitted diseases, yes, those ones, of course, they're infectious. And, and if they travel, if they travel all the way up, they can also affect the kidneys also, too. So just in case you are watching this and uh, you are thinking, okay, so how can I get hold of uh, Dr. Obiora? And by the way, I'm the secretary because I will be the one that will send you the invoice. I'm just kidding. It's going to be free of charge, I'm guessing. So if you have any question, you know, I just made mention of a Kinaet show uh, that, okay, you have a question, maybe for one reason or the other, you couldn't post your question. So feel free to post your, to send him your question at uh, that particular email address uh, showing on the screen. God bless you as you do that. As we begin to tidy up, I know we we have just a few seconds left. We normally do what is called like a take home. So uh, what is called elevator speech. So like summarizing what we've uh, said all uh, within this last one hour, so what will you say to our audience just in one minute summarizing everything that we've discussed if uh dr kina or mr Lex doesn't have any other question though what i'll say to our audience is make sure you check your blood pressure you must have normal blood pressure if you have hypertension there's so many medicines your doctor can put you on after you've done all the necessary prevention if you're diabetic make sure your glucose levels are very well controlled. The key to kidney disease is prevention. Mm. As in all diseases, prevention is 10 times better than cure. So it's all about prevention. And the only way you prevent it is by controlling your blood pressure. If you're diabetic, control diabetes also. Get a primary care physician. Go check your numbers. Go do your labs. Find out what your kidney numbers are. Find out what you are at risk for. Uh, there are so many other things we did not go into. We didn't go into the congenital causes of kidney problems. Some people are just predisposed by virtue of their family history, you know, and, and those are things your doctor can look into also. But key thing is prevention, blood pressure, diabetes, and also check your cholesterol and all of that things. Thank you. Wow, wow. I mean, it's been an awesome, awesome moment. I mean, I've already given my testimony already. I didn't know that we will last this one hour. Trust me. In fact, I private message uh, the host and the co-host that, okay, can we, is it a must that we must spend an hour? Because as I said, I was looking at, okay, this topic is looking, it was looking so boring to me. But at the same time, I ended up just getting a lot of values, and I believe others also did the same thing. So, Mr. Alex, what will you say is your take home from today's show? My take home is prevention is better than cure. Take mm. care of your kidney. <laughs> that is a huge one. That is a huge one. And uh, of course, once again, my name is Emmanuel Adigbola, and I was so excited to be here. Over to you, Dr. Kina, as she tidy up the show today. Wow, another wonderful show. Thank you, Dr. Dozo, for this um, um, wonderful show. And I, I shared earlier that I will say why we actually started, um, chose this topic to be the first of the year. Um, sometime last year, I went to the doctor and the doctor called me to tell me that my EJFR was low. And I'm not really going to say the number because everybody will be shocked if I did say the number. So I started looking into it and I found out that most of us, especially those that do not visit the doctor, get their labs done, will never know what their kidney function is. And I do mine regularly. So it came to me as a shock. 
that was the reason I decided that we should do this show so that others could learn and take care of themselves. We've been going through this show, different topics for the last two years. And it all boils down to go to see your doctor, eat well, increase your fiber intake, drink water. Today, we learn to drink only when we're thirsty though. Drink water, exercise, and make sure you see your PCP regularly. Thank you, and we will all see you on the next show. Thank you very much. <laughs>